Hey, I'm Elijah, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad that you're here, and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's Find message. Out. So this morning, uh, as, as Josh has been preaching the last couple of weeks, we're going to be continuing our, our series uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to see, examine Jesus' words where he specifically calls his followers to be concise and, just, and straightforward in their prayers, the opposite of that growth community. But I want to look at what Jesus has to say. So grab your Bibles. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 this morning. In the Sermon on the Mount. We'll pick it up really in verse 5, recap a little bit of where we've been the last few weeks here, and then we'll um, specifically be focusing on verses 7 and 8, but Matthew chapter 6, we'll start reading in verse 5. So Jesus is, is speaking here. We're picking it up in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It says in Matthew 6, 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So we're picking up Jesus here, as, as, as Josh talked about last week. <clears throat> Instructions first and, and foremost when it comes to prayer. Do not be like the hypocrites. The hypocrites, they were seeking attention. You know, so much so that they couldn't even go from their homes to the synagogue without praying. They would have to stop on the way in the middle on the most popular street corners, and they just had to pray right then and there because they were just so holy. But ultimately, what Jesus is getting at here in the first couple of verses is that the hypocrites, the Pharisees, the teachers of the day, their motives were wrong. They were praying to be seen by others and not to be seen by the Lord. And so Jesus says, kind of a stern warning here, that they've already received their reward. The attention of people, the admiration, whatever it might be, that's, that's what they're going to get. They're not going to be rewarded by, by our Heavenly Father um, for this fake prayer. But rather, Jesus' instructions to his followers is, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. The, the opposite here of the attention seeking. And, and you know, as Josh talked about last week, I don't think... We take this 100% literally in the sense that you can only pray when you're in a room. No, no, there's a place for communal prayer, absolutely, but it's the motivation is always the question. What's the motive behind the heart, behind prayer here? And so Jesus continues it, verse 7 and 8, verse 7 specifically, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And so continuing here with the wrong way to pray. Jesus says, do not heap up empty phrases here as the Gentiles do. Do not, do not use many words. The, really, the word here, and as I would mentioned even before, is this idea of babbling. They were just trying to fill time to make their prayers kind of two things, uh, as long as possible, but also they were trying to say as many words as possible to just find the right words. Uh, oftentimes in the non-Jewish world at this time, prayer was characterized by a formal invocation, having to say the right thing, or a magical incantation in which the correct repetition counted instead of the worshiper's attitude or intention. And so in a lot of people, they had this false idea of prayer, specifically to their false gods. If they just said the right words, it was like a key to unlock a door. If I could just say the right thing, well, then my God will give me what I want. My God will answer my, my prayer here. And so Jesus says very clearly, do not be like the pagans or the Gentiles. Some translations uh, translate it either way. But ultimately, kind of what people are trying to do in their false prayer to their false gods, their false deities, they were trying to manipulate their gods. 
with many words, with, with the right words. They oftentimes used many names for their, as many names for their gods as possible, just hoping that maybe one of them is the right one, hoping that just one of them strikes the right chord with their God, that in, in his favor, that that God is then going to give them what they want to answer their prayer. They would also, they would remind their gods of the good things that they have done for their God, essentially reminding their, their deities of the things that their deities owed them. Well, well, I, I did this for you. You know, God, you know, whatever, whoever their God was, now you owe me this favor here. But ultimately, Jesus just boils that all down by calling their words, their prayers with these wrong motives, these wrong intents, empty phrases. They were babbling. They were, they were stuttering. They had empty words that didn't mean anything. And so I want to look at one example of this in the Old Testament. If you want to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18, look at a familiar story to, to many of you probably, but hope to, to see the connection here to Jesus' words. 1 Kings chapter 18. We'll start in verse 20 here. 1 Kings 18, 20. I want to see an example of what Jesus is talking about. We'll look at first what Jesus says and not to do, and then from there, ultimately, what to do, how we are to pray here. First Kings chapter 18, pick it up here with, with the prophet Elijah, a time when the Israelites are going back and forth between the Lord and heaven and ultimately many false idols here. And it comes to a point where the Lord prompted Elijah to say something to them. And so let's pick it up in, in verse 20 here, 1 Kings chapter 18, 20. It says, Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word so Elijah is prompted <clears throat> by the Lord to be honest before the people. And so he calls them to a point. And he says, you have been limping between false gods, specifically Baal at this time, and the Lord. He says that you can't have both. It's not one foot in both boats. No. Where are you putting your trust? Who is your God? Who are you going to worship today? He says, how long will you go limping between these two different opinions? And so ultimately... Elijah challenges them and their God <clears throat> to a contest. He says, let's, let's take this altar, let's, let's make a sacrifice on this altar, and let's see which of our gods will, will take that sacrifice, will send down fire on it. If you think your God is real, and you think your God is powerful and <clears throat> worth the worship, well, then let's see if he ans answers your prayers. And so uh, they, they set up two altars, and... Uh, they, let, let's kind of pick it up here in verse 26. Let's see what they did. Not, they didn't set up two altars, pardon me. But verse 26, so the Israelites here with Baal, it says, they took the bowl that was given them and they prepared it. And they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered and they limped around an altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud, and they cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. So the Israelites calling out to Baal, they called out for hours, <clears throat> from morning until noon, it says. Elijah then ends up kind of mocking them, and he says, oh, is your God busy? You know, is he relieving himself? Ultimately, is he in the bathroom? Is he taking care of something? Like, he's just kind of poking at them. Like, it's those are the kind of things in Scripture that always crack me up. Like, this is a righteous man, but he's mocking them. I don't, I don't know. I don't know quite exactly, but... Uh, the Israelites then, after this, says, 
after the mocking, they begin to ramp up. And rather than just words and actions crying out to their God, they begin to show their dedication to Baal. They, they're cutting themselves, cutting their bodies to show their sincerity. I think as Jesus was talking about, they believed that they could manipulate their God, Baal, with their words and with their actions. But ultimately, Baal didn't answer because Baal is not the Lord. He is not powerful. And so let's, I want to see, I think it's so interesting, Elijah's response. Let's look for the, the contrast here between the two. Verse 36 At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let, no, let not one of them escape. And they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. And so Elijah, in contrast to the Israelites and their worship of Baal, didn't cry out and didn't remind Baal of the things he had done for them, didn't make it an us versus you, God, thing, you owe me something. He didn't cut himself or mutilate himself in a way to show his dedication. No, he called out to God with sincerity and trust. He fully trusted the power of the Lord. In his ultimate motivation, his desire was that the people would come back to the Lord. It wasn't self-seeking at this point, but it was the glory and the honor of the Lord. And the Lord answered that prayer, sent fire down upon the altar, so much so that it even licked up the water that was around it. Just, it wasn't just like a little flame. No, it burnt up the entire thing. We see very clearly the power of the Lord in that moment. And the Israelites had the proper response in this moment. They fell on their faces when they saw the power and the majesty of the Lord. That was their proper response. So I think there's a couple takeaways for us here as we keep Jesus' words in mind. I think the first is that God cannot be manipulated. Our Lord in heaven is, is not one that we can use for our own purposes that we can think, well, if I just, I know my motivation is wrong, but if I say the right thing, then God's going to answer. No, God cannot be manipulated. The second takeaway for us is that prayer can be misplaced. The motivation of prayer is what matters. If we're praying in a sense that we're trying to gotcha God, well, God, I'm just going to do this and, and then you owe me something, that's misplaced. It's what's the motivation behind it? It's that we trust that the Lord can and will answer according to his perfect will. And we must ask when it comes to prayer, as we examine ourselves, what is my motivation? Are you trying to get something from God? Is it self-seeking? Are you trying to make yourself look better? Or is what you're asking in line with God's character and His power and His majesty here? And I don't think oftentimes we specifically do the same things that the Israelites and the Jewish people, the non-Gentiles, or the Gentiles, pardon me, the non-Jewish people, the pagans, I don't think we, we do the exact same things as them, but I think there's still many wrong motivations for prayer that we pray. You know, the first that we've seen here is, is this idea of trying to manipulate the Lord in our prayers. Jesus says, that's not going to do, that's not going to work. That's not going to happen. Don't, don't, don't do that. But the next thing, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2 tells us, 
You don't have to turn there, but it says, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Don't be rash with your mouth or, or hasty to utter a word before the Lord. I think the second type of prayer that we have is, is a hastiness, a flippancy in our prayers. But the preacher here in Ecclesiastes says that the fool utters flippant prayers, making promises to God that they will not keep. You know, the, the type of prayer where it's like, God, if you just help me pass this test, I promise I'll go to church for the next six weeks, every single week. You know, we, we just, we, it's tempting for us in the moment to say, well, I, I just, if I do something for God in this moment, then there's a greater chance that he's gonna give me what I want right now. But that ultimately for us shows a lack of fear of the Lord, that we don't have the awe for him that he deserves. As Ecclesiastes says, is seen by the fact that God is in heaven and you are on earth. He is high above us. His thoughts are way above us. His, his perfect will is so much higher than us. And he deserves the worship and that awe to not come to him and offer just empty words and false praises and flippant prayers here. I think there's a couple other types of prayers. It's, it's again, this quick fix prayer, this flippant prayer. We live in a society where we want things instantly. You know, I was, I was backstage here and I was looking, there was a verse that I was trying to remember. I, I didn't want to scroll through my whole Bible looking for it. I went to Google, right? Like I wanted to know the answer right then and there. We, there's so many things where we expect instant results. And in prayer, often the temptation is to be flippant and to want instant results in it. I think another type of prayer that's tempting that Jesus is hitting at here is the idea of thoughtless, mechanical prayer. You know, the type of prayer that you pray just before the meal because you just always do it. You say the same thing over and over, but the words are empty. They're just that. They're, they're words, but nothing more. We must be weary of that. You know, one that I find myself as I was even just preparing and, and praying that the Lord began to just awaken it in my heart was the desire to be impressive in our prayers. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm up in front of people a lot. I, I pray a lot in front of people. And there's a temptation for me to, ahead of time, plan out exactly what I'm going to say and to use big words and to put as much scripture in there as possible I even just experienced this last night at, at the wedding that I officiated. There was a, there was a chance that maybe grandpa or dad was going to say the prayer before the meal or, or maybe somebody else, but they were like, can you be on backup just in case everybody else backs out? And I'm like, yep, like happy to, happy to pray before the meal. And so, you know, I know it's about time. I'm, I find myself thinking in my head, okay, what am I going to say? I need to sound pastoral. I need to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I got I to gotta make sure I say something in there about like big words of matrimony and marriage and like all this stuff. And even then, like the sermon's on my mind. And I'm just like, no, like it's not about being impressive because my motivation was, well, I don't want to look stupid. I want to look good in front of them. Now, it's not wrong to just think about what you're going to say before you say it. It's not wrong even to read written prayers. You know, there's many written prayers that I've prayed that, that many people have, have written. But if they're just words, that's the warning from Jesus here. I think the, the last type of prayer that we need to be weary of is long prayers for the sake of long prayers. Jesus says here in Matthew 6, he doesn't say, do not heap up, um, well, sorry, another translation actually translates uh, vain repetition. Instead of empty phrases, it's the same idea here. When you pray, do not use vain repetition here because people will, the Gentiles think that they will be heard because of their many words. And so it's not that long prayers are wrong, but vain repetition. Not that repetition is wrong, not that it's wrong to pray before the meal and pray before you go to bed, but if it's purely a ritual, it's just purely something you do where you say the words, but you're not calling out to the Lord with authenticity and honesty here. If the focus is on the length of time or the words rather than the Lord, our, our focus is wrong. You know, Jesus, he 
prayed all night long. Luke 6.12 tells us in some other places that Jesus prayed all night long. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. In Luke 18, Jesus tells the parable of a persistent widow who, because she's just persistent enough, finally her, her prayer, finally she gets what she's been asking for because of her persistence. And so it's not that long prayers and repetition are wrong, but it's vain repetition that is condemned. I think Matthew Henry in his commentary puts it so well. He says, the danger of this error is when we only say our prayers and not when we pray them. The warning from Jesus is that our words, just because you're saying the words doesn't mean it's prayer. But when we're honest before the Lord, when we're seeking to connect with Him, to bring our burdens and our anxieties and our requests before Him, that's when it becomes prayer. It's not that we got to say the right words to just unlock the favor of the Lord. No, we're going to see in just a moment why that, that's, not, that's not it. The error is in when we say our prayers only and not when we pray them. Let's not be people who say empty words and empty phrases trying to look good and impress the Lord because we can't. Verse 8 tells us, Do not be like them, like the pagans, the Gentiles, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Before we even ask the Lord for something in prayer, He knows what we need. And I think that can lead us to two places. The first is, well, then why pray? If God knows what I need, why should I even pray? Do we, do we need to pray? Is it even worthwhile? Well, God is not like us. He's not persuaded with long, drawn-out arguments. We can't just lull him with empty words into finally giving in. And yes, God, he has determined all outcomes. But the key here is that the Lord has also determined the means by which these outcomes will come about. He uses our prayers to bring about his will. What, what a, a quote that helped me understand it, uh, a pastor named Paul Rizkala said this. He said, put simply, God gives us the privilege of including us in his work. This is the great promise and the motivation for our prayer, that the Lord already knows what we need. We're not trying to manipulate him, to pin him in a corner, or remind him how much he owes us. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his commentary, his studies in the Sermon on the Mount, which is phenomenal. If you're looking to study the Sermon on the Mount at all, I can't recommend him. And if I know Josh has um, even, you know, had quotes on the screen of, of his, but he says this. I found it so helpful in my own just personal wrestling through of this. I must get rid of this thought that God is standing between me and my desires and that which is best for me. I must see God as my Father who has purchased my ultimate good in Christ and is waiting to bless me with his own fullness in Jesus Christ. It's not that God has good things for us locked behind a paywall of prayer. No, it's that the Lord has already bought our ultimate good through his Son, Jesus Christ. And in prayer, we partner with him. This must be our motivation to pray, trusting that God knows exactly what we need before we even ask, and then petitioning Him and asking Him to use us to carry out His purposes. And for me, put, put simply, prayer is not informing or impressing God, but it's partnering with Him. 
It's not that we're trying to let him know about what's going on. God, I, I, I just, not sure if you saw, but would you be with this situation? No, the Lord sees and the Lord knows. And it's not that we're trying to impress him with the right words and the phrases just to say exactly what we need. But no, we trust that he knows. And we trust that we can't impress him. But then we partner with him in prayer because he uses believers to accomplish his will in the here and now. So we've seen how not to pray. How then, as we kind of take all this and boil it down, how then are we to pray? Well, the things we're to avoid, if we take those, ultimately then we are to pray, taken from Jesus' words here, with sincerity, with directness, with simplicity, but ultimately with confidence that God knows our needs and that he can do far above all we even ask or all we imagine. And so our prayer is, prayer is honesty. It's a, a lifting up of the soul and a pouring out of our hearts. One of the most beautiful promises that I come back to over and over what I find so interesting about prayer is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. If we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. What's so amazing, what's so counter cultural, what's so the opposite of the pagan prayer is that prayer is not ultimately even about getting the right words and saying the right things. Because if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord, believed upon him for salvation, you've been made new, you're a new creation, you have the Holy Spirit has been placed inside of you. And the promise is that even when we don't have the right words, when you find yourself at the end of yourself, you don't even know what to say or how to say it, the goodness of the Lord and the Holy Spirit that's inside of you will, will intercede for you between the Father and you to be praying for you and to say the words you don't even know how to say. When we don't know how to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us. This is the power of the gospel. It's not even about the words, but it's about our heart and our attitude. The Holy Spirit that intercedes between the Lord and us. You know, and we are tempted to impress and to inform when our pride is calling, saying, you got to look good in front of this person. You got to pray the best prayer, whatever that might be. Even then, when our pride is telling us this, the work of Christ is sufficient for us. And as the Holy Spirit prays for us, between us as humans and God the Father, so Christ ultimately has interceded for us once and for all. It's the good news of the gospel, Jesus Christ, that though we, in our sin, in our pride, in our thinking that we can do it, that we can earn our way to the Lord, we can just do the right thing, that we can do more good than bad and make up for our sin. All those things are like filthy rags before the Lord, even our, our best works. No, though we are sinful and have been separated from the Lord, the Lord came down. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, to live the perfect life that we could not, to set the example for us in his speech, in his attitude, in his prayer life. Then ultimately, he was killed for it on the cross where he took the weight of our sin and our shame, though he did not deserve it in his perfect life, in his perfect obedience to the Father. He said for three days, and then three days later, he's raised a life to show his power over sin and death and pride and the evil one. 
And he appeared to a couple thousand people. He went back up to the Father and then sent us the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that is our comforter and our helper and that prays for us when we do not know what to pray. And if you've never made that decision to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and to turn of your sin, you don't have the Holy Spirit that's been imparted in you. But it's as simple as Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. At that moment, you're made new. You call upon the Lord for salvation. You turn of your sin. You receive the Holy Spirit who is praying for us. And so to conclude, when we're tempted to impress with our prayers, we remember the cross. When we're tempted to draw out our prayers and to fill with words that seem holier, no, we remember the holiness of Christ, his perfect sacrifice. When we're tempted to just toss out a flippant prayer, we remember the sacrifice of Christ's life on the cross, that his wasn't flippant. When we're tempted to inform God of what's going on, we remember that he knows what we need before we even ask. And we have confidence that as his children, as a good father, he wants to hear from us when we cry out in honesty. And he wants to use us to carry out his will in the here and now. And when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying for us, interceding in ways that we, that our words could never. It's the promise of the gospel, the scriptures. Amen. Let's pray. But I thank you for the beauty of your word and the beauty of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that when in our pride, when our pride comes calling, Lord, even then we're not too far gone. Lord, still your son, Jesus Christ, and his work is sufficient for us. But I just pray that we, as your people, Lord, as we, we would be known of our humility, Lord, that we'd remember your sacrifice, or that we'd have confidence to come before you honestly, Lord, not trying to get something from you, but to be a part of what you're doing, Lord, to seek your glory first and foremost. Can I thank you that we can come boldly to your throne because of your son, Jesus Christ. Praise in the precious and the powerful name, his name.